Welcome to the Messy Antics Podcast, a podcast about all things Messianic Judaism. Each episode, we will be sharing our opinions as we tackle some of the biggest issues in Messianic Judaism. Now, here's your hosts, Rabbis Eric, David, Jonathan, and Toby. Hey, everybody. This is the Messy Antics Podcast. Uh, welcome. We're happy you're here listening, wherever you are. Uh, this is Rabbi Toby. I'm here with Rabbi David and Rabbi Eric and Rabbi Jonathan. And this week we are here to talk about, it's going to be tough to try to keep this uh, short but because this is a pretty big subject, but we're here to talk about uh, legalism and how that is um, being a, not just a, a believer, but particularly being a Messianic believer, because oftentimes Messianic Jews and non-Jews, Messianic believers, um, oftentimes are accused of being legalistic and uh, simply because of the fact that one of the things about Messianic Judaism is the emphasis on uh, observing the Torah. Uh, I want to start by uh, looking at a scripture here uh, from Jeremiah. It's Jeremiah chapter 31. And this is this is where this is a, this is a big Messianic prophecy because we call uh, you know what Yeshua was uh, Jesus is the new covenant that he's embodied in the new covenant. It's it's um, it, it, and, and the new covenant is putting your faith in Messiah Yeshua for forgiveness of sins, but also receiving the Holy Spirit. But it's not just it, it's not just receiving the Holy Spirit. It, it, the Holy Spirit has a function, and and Jeremiah gets gets a prophecy about this. Uh, I, I just want to read beginning in verse thirty one of Jeremiah chapter thirty one, or excuse me, chapter thirty. Uh, Jeremiah chapter thirty one, verse thirty. Uh, Behold, days are coming, and again, this is in the Tanakh. This is in the Old Testament. Behold, days are coming. It is a declaration of Adonai when I will make a new covenant with the house of Israel and with the house of Judah, not like the covenant I made with their fathers in the day I took them by the hand to bring them out of the land of Egypt. For they broke my covenant, though I was a husband to them. It is a declaration of Adonai, but this is the covenant I will make in the house of Israel after those days. It is a declaration of Adonai. I will put my Torah within them. Yes, I will write it on their heart. I will be their God and they will be my people. So God in this prophecy is making a distinction between it's not going to be like the covenant I made in the days of Moses when I gave the written Torah. It's going to be a new covenant that will cause the Torah to be on their hearts. And that right there, I think, is the basis of how we relate to the Torah differently as believers in Messiah Yeshua, right? Yeah, it's interesting when Paul is writing, or whoever wrote the book of Hebrews, uh, I actually don't believe it was Paul, but most people do, so I'm going to leave it that way for now. But when he's writing it, the author of Hebrews, the author of Hebrews is easier to say than Paul, who's really maybe not the author of Hebrews. Possibly Luke. I think it was Luke, but we'll have that discussion another day. But anyhow, he quotes directly from Jeremiah when he uh, these verses uh, directly. It's an an exact quote from Jeremiah 31, talking about the Torah being on the heart of the believer and the responsibility of a believer to that text that if you are a born-again believer, then the Torah should be on your heart. Now, how we respond to that is really important because that's the difference between uh, legalism or not legalism. I had a Messianic rabbi one time. I was at a conference, and uh, we were talking to each other, and he looked at me wearing my seat seat, and he said, I used to wear seat seat. And uh, he looked at me, he said, uh, I used to wear seat seat. I said, you did? I, he said, yeah, but I stopped wearing them. And I said, why? He said, well, I was praying one day, and the Lord told me I was being legalistic. And so I asked him, I said, can I ask you a question? He said, what? I said, why didn't you just stop being legalistic? In, instead of stop obeying God's commandment to wear a fringe, why not just do it for the right reason, from the right perspective, with the right heart, rather than doing away with it? That's like... Uh, I don't keep kosher anymore because I was getting legalistic about it. No, you just stop being legalistic about it. It's interesting how many times when I get confronted by pastors and others who accuse me of being legalistic because of my desire to try to walk a Torah-compliant or pursuant life, that when I ask them questions like, uh, excuse me, uh, I know that you have an issue with me keeping the Sabbath or with me keeping kosher, but have you committed adultery today? And then, no, no. So why not? Well, we're, we're commanded not to. No, no. Isn't that legalistic? 
Wouldn't it be just as legalistic for you not to commit adultery, which is one of the Ten Commandments given in 20 of Exodus, as it would be for me to keep the Shabbat? I mean, they're both in the same section of Scripture. So if my keeping Shabbat is legalistic, then your not committing adultery is equally legalistic. That conversation usually doesn't end well, but it's a true and real thing that we need to understand that there is a way we can keep God's commandments from a heart of submission and thanksgiving and grace and mercy, love love of uh, and understanding of God's forgiveness toward us that allows us to keep the commandments without it being legalistic. I try, I define legalism as doing something in order to earn something. In right. other words, if I'm keeping the Sabbath to earn redemption, then I am being legalistic. Yes. But I'm keep if I'm keeping Sabbath because I have redemption, then I'm not being legalistic. I'm being grateful and thankful. Delight versus duty. Exactly. Yeah. I said last night at, at CMC we're doing a, a in depth topical study right now in our Bible study on the one new man. Looking at it, which through the pers- just dropping a little line. If you haven't listened to that, go to Congregation Mayim Chaim's uh, website or their Facebook page and catch yourself up on this study because it's really been powerful. Uh, and so last night in this talk, you know, we're we're looking at the idea of Jew and Gentile as one in the body of Messiah and what that looks like and so on. And one of the things I said last night several times was that uh, uh, salvation should prompt obedience, right? We aren't obedient for salvation's sake. Salvation leads to obedience. Yeshua says, if you love me, you will obey my commands. And by the way, at the time that he said that, uh, the, the New Testament didn't exist yet. So when he says that, he's talking about the Torah, uh, right? And so in 1 John 3, 4, uh, uh, John says, everyone practicing sin also practices lawlessness. Indeed, sin is lawlessness. And so the the reality is is that what the Torah does, as Paul talks about when he looks at the idea of the Torah as a guardian, uh, right? The the idea of what the Torah does is the Torah points out where we may have areas of flaw in our life that we still need to submit to the Lord. It's not like we're supposed to live out the mitzvot of the Torah, the commandments of the Torah, or anything else for that matter. By the way, as an aside, the very same Christians that often will say Messianic uh, believers are legalistic because we strive to obey the Torah as best we can by the leading of the Ruach HaKodesh, the, the very same Christians that say we're legalistic will often be very legalistic about their own Christian traditions. Like Sunday. Uh, like Sunday as opposed to Shabbat. Or, uh, the, Modest apparel. Yeah, the, church, jewelry. the church that my dad became a believer in, that my mom grew up in, uh, was very legalistic in a lot of ways, Men had to wear, they weren't allowed to wear shorts. They had to have a specific type of haircut. Uh, they weren't supposed to have facial hair. They couldn't wear any jewelry except maybe a single wedding ring. Uh, women had to have long hair. They had to have skirts uh, that went a certain length and sleeves that went a certain length. And they had to uh, no uh, TV, wear makeup. No movies, no dancing. The, the only movies, you could have a TV if you watch movies that were approved by the denomination. That was it. Right. Videotapes, yeah, yeah. not actually yeah. watching what Which was Which is on just the- absolutely absurd because, number one, the rea- – and I get it. Like I get where those those legalistic traditions come from. And, and what's funny is is they're the very the, – where they come from is the very same thing that Judaism does that the church says we're being legalistic about. Or that the church says the traditions of Judaism are too difficult and so on. Uh, it's very much the Talmudic concept of building fences. Right? right, that we we know that men can be tempted by a woman when they look at a woman. Now, I, I'm going to say this, and I'll, uh, my wife and I just had this conversation the other day. We we tend to put the precipice of the weight of a man diverting his eyes on the woman yeah. that the woman should dress such a way so that they're not uh, uh, sexualized in the man's perspective and and I'm look modesty is a very important thing I'm not writing off the necessity for modesty yeah. but what I am saying is I think we need to have the more important conversation about men and how they need to retrain themselves and how we as fathers need to raise our children up to not objectify and sex uh, sexualize women uh, and, and so on so 
so that that doesn't even have to be a conversation. Yeah. Uh, but we, we put all the weight on the women. The woman's got to straighten themselves up so the man can't be tempted. No, the man needs to adjust his attitude, his life, his his submission to the Lord so that that temptation isn't a problem uh, uh, and what have you. Uh, so that that's just an aside. But the, the reality is, is in the Talmud, there's this concept of building fences. And, uh, you know, we're currently sitting around a, a desk that it's very uncomfortable because mine and Toby's legs have nowhere to go. Um, but we're sitting around a desk as we're recording this. And if hypothetically speaking, the Torah says that it is a sin to touch this desk, obviously very hypothetical. This desk didn't exist when the Torah was given. But if the Torah says it's a sin to touch this desk, at some point, a rabbi is going to come by and go, you know, Adam and Eve were tempted just because they saw the fruit and they were tempted to taste it and see what it would do and, and, and so on. And the enemy said, well, what, what what's the worst that could happen, right? Threw that temptation out. Uh, and a rabbi would come by and go, it's, it's pretty tempting to just reach out and touch it just to see what would happen if we touch it. Um, and so he'll come by and say, okay, well, we're going to say if you come within a 10-foot radius of this this uh, desk, then you've sinned. You know, you, you've got to avoid the, the 10-foot radius so that you aren't tempted to reach out and be tempted to find out what would happen if you were tempted and touched it. Another rabbi years later will come by and go, okay, that fence isn't far enough because you can still see it and you can still kind of climb over that fence and touch it. And so we're going to say you can't come within this property. And then down the road, another rabbi, you can't come in this county and then you can't come in this state and then you can't come in this country because you might get too close to being too close to being too close to maybe sort of kind of potentially being tempted to touch that table that God said not to touch. Yeah. Um, right. The reality is, is these fences sometimes though, though in their originality, had a very solid purpose. It was the shepherd trying to protect the flock. And I get that. That's awesome. But there's a certain point where these fences get so far removed that we no longer know why God said not to touch that table in the first place. Was it electrified? Was there uh, uh, something that could easily be broken? Was there a leg that had an issue that it was going to topple over? Was there, like, what was the purpose? Why did God say not to touch that desk? Um, and, and so we get so far removed. And the same is true with a, a lot of the the kind of legalistic practices that are found in the church. While they're pointing fingers at Judaism and at Messianic Judaism about legal, being legalistic, you have all of these, you know, why can't you watch TV? Why can't you watch uh, uh, a football program, why, a football game? Why can't you watch, you know, whatever move? Why can't you watch? Well, because of this and this. And, okay, great. You have these protective measures that you've set up around them. They're not the word of God because I, I hate to break it to you if you didn't know this, TVs and movies didn't exist when the Torah was given. It didn't exist when the New Testament was was codified. It didn't exist any of that. It wasn't, it wasn't a part of this. So you can't go, the Bible says not to do this because it's just not there. We've built as shepherds, we've built fences around uh, to protect our flock, and that's great. But you still need to understand the why. What's the purpose to it? And, that's and you where- can't let the fence become equal in Correct. value to, to the, the actual, actual commandment. commandment. Yep. And that's where the problem comes in is like we do things out of obedience because of salvation. Not to earn brownie points in heaven. It's got nothing. I don't not eat ham sandwiches because I think it's going to earn me something better in heaven. Like not in the least. As a matter of fact, Matthew 5, Yeshua says uh, uh, that um, I've not come to do away with or to abolish the, the, the Torah but to fulfill it. And he says those that uh, – uh, uh, teach others to to keep the greatest of these will be the greatest in the kingdom. Those that teach others to do the least of these will be the least in the kingdom. I don't know what that looks like. I can tell you in my own head. I see things a lot of times like you know uh, a, a TV or movie or whatever in my head. It's just the way I picture it. But in my head, I look at it like a ball stadium, right? That everybody gets in the gates. The ticket is salvation. Everybody gets in the gates. But the, those that teach others to do the greatest. And by the way, it doesn't say those that do the greatest. It's those that teach others to do the greatest. So and the, keep them. Yeah. So the precipice of the weight of that is upon the shepherd still. By the right. way, to care for, nurture, and protect our flock, to disciple them, as Rabbi Toby was talking about before we started this recording uh, is this idea of discipleship, uh, uh, discipling the flock. And so when we look at this, uh, the the what Yeshua is saying, again, in my head, picturing it like a ball stadium, is everybody gets in the gate. If you have the blood of Messiah upon you, you get in the gate. You got the ticket to get in the, 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 the gate of the stadium. Uh, but I'm not comfortable just taking the easy road and getting the nosebleed seats. Like, mm-hmm. I want to be on the 50-yard line. I want to be on the first base line as close as I can get to the field. I want to smell the stink of the players in the dugout. Like, I want to know that I'm there. And I don't want to rob myself of everything God's got in store for me. It has nothing to do with my salvation. It's a response to salvation. Salvation was given freely uh, and 
Because of that, as you talked earlier, Rabbi Toby, the idea of the Jeremiah 31, the new covenant, the, the word being etched upon the flesh of our heart, uh, that is something that now we're not living out the commandments uh, because we feel like we have to to earn something, but instead we're living it out because it's flowing from the inside out. Right. I, I look at this very much like I look at making a bed. Uh, just so that, Yeah, I never do that. It's a terrible yeah, idea. I think that I don't understand the concept of making a bed. Just going to mess it all you, up again. You're just going to go back. I understand when you change the sheets and you clean and then you make the bed. But in between those times, making the bed serves no purpose to me. I don't understand the concept. But my wife likes the bed to be made every day. So in our home, whoever of us is the last one out of the bed in the morning makes the bed. Now, when Pammy gets up early, which she does most of the time, she gets up before me, I make the bed. Now, there are days when I wake up and I look at the bed and I go, I'm going to make this stupid bed. I don't want to make the bed. This is dumb to me. I don't know. And, and growl doing it. That's legalism. Mm-hmm. I'm doing it not out of a desire to bless and serve my wife, to love my wife, to demonstrate my love for her. I'm doing it out of a a if I don't do this, she'll be mad at me, or this will happen, or you know, we'll have an argument, or whatever. I'll get blamed for the whole world going to pot, you know, all that. But there are other days I wake up and I go, I want to make her happy. I want to be a blessing. I love my wife, and so I make the bed. My heart doing those things is different between when I desire to do it because of the blessing of my wife and to bless her, or out of a desire not to have a fight or an argument or any of that to go on. That's exactly the same as keeping the mitzvot or the commandments. When we keep them grudgingly, Mm. then we're doing it legalistically. We're doing it in order to not be in trouble with God, in order to, you know, whatever. But when we have the right heart— when we're doing it because he loved us and we love him, and this is how we relate to each other, then we're not being legalistic. And it doesn't matter what commandment it is, you can follow a commandment legalistically or you can follow it with love. It's like tithing or giving. You can give with a cheerful heart or you can give grudgingly. Mm-hmm. One is legalistic. Yeah. And one is given from a, a place of love and honor. And that's the difference between keeping the commandments legalistically and not. And unfortunately, many of the people in the church that look at Messianic Jews and think we're being legalistic either don't have a relationship with a Messianic Jew where they actually ask the question, or they were put into a conversation or a dialogue with a Messianic Jew who used the mitzvot as a baseball bat to beat up that Christian Mm -hmm. for not keeping the commandments and thereby portrayed it in a legalistic fashion instead of a love fashion. Right. Yeah. I I think that – and that leads to just something – a point I wanted to make. I think the reason why – I think the big reason why believers in the the church – are so um, have such a animosity towards the Torah is because they misunderstand the Apostle Paul. And you have to understand, one, when you're reading Paul's letters, it's the same as listening to somebody talk on the phone. You can't hear what the person they're talking to is saying. You can only hear the person that you're sitting next to on the phone saying. Yeah. That's one thing. The fact is that Paul was dealing with two major issues. God is bringing people of the nations who knew nothing about Judaism into a Jewish faith. And the second issue is he was dealing with opponents, you know, the, 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 those of the, uh, of the circumcision is what he called them, that were saying, you have to do these things. You have to do this. You have to do that. And Paul's, so he's combating them on one end. It's like he's fighting a war on two fronts. It's like literally if you're watching a movie and a, and, and a, a guy's fighting multiple people and you're like, how is he going to get out of this? This is what Paul's doing. He's fighting – people with the circumcision like saying stop stop like you foolish Galatians who's who told you that you could do this on your own without grace and then he's also telling them also reminding them also you are coming into a, a faith that's Jewish and, and and so and Paul never negated the Torah but it, if you read him wrong it would seem like he is like when he talks about oh the law showed me I was sinful so they're like well let's stay away from it 
right? I, I just think that, that that's a big right. reason and, why. It's a misunderstanding yeah, in of my, soul. In my commentary on Galatians, I begin with the concept of de- figuring out who it's talking to. You know, you're, the New Testament writings, the writings of Paul and others who wrote the epistles, are writing to one of four groups of people. They're either writing to Jewish people who are not yet believers or Jewish people who are believers or Gentiles who are not yet believers or Gentiles who are believers. And when you talk to those groups of people, you're going to talk in different ways. The same way if I were a dietitian and I was writing a book to obese people and then I wrote a a book to uh, people that are anorexic, to an obese person, I might say, if you don't stop eating so much, you're going to kill yourself. If I spoke to an anorexic, I would say, if you don't start eating more, you're going to kill yourself. Right. Yeah. And and if you took both of those things and just kind of interposed them, you would think that I was contradicting, uh, contradicting myself when, when I'm not. And so when Paul is writing to Jewish people, there are times that he's saying, you, I know that you've kept the commandments all your life, but you can't depend on keeping the commandments commandments for your redemption. You have to depend on Messiah for your redemption. And then he's talking to non-Jewish people and saying, uh, you know, don't depend or or you need to start understanding the concepts of Torah and and God's word and things and and doing it all together. So it's important to understand that both of those things are accurate, that, that a Jewish person can't depend on the Torah, obedience to the Torah for the redemption, but having been redeemed, they do have to depend on obedience to the Torah for their lifestyle. Mm-hmm. Right. And those things are, are vital. But if you look at it like I said about if you're if you're reading the words written to an anorexic as if they were written to an obese person, you're going to misunderstand yep. what's being said and you're gonna twist it to be something it wasn't. And to that point is since you were just dealing with Galatians, particularly uh as you were mentioning it, uh Galatians five is one of my favorite passages to 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 deal with this conversation on uh, the idea of legalism and whether or not um, a a Messianic Jewish um, understanding of Torah observance is legalistic or not. Uh, Galatians 5.13, Paul says, Brothers and sisters, you were called to freedom. Only do not let your freedom become an opportunity for the flesh, but through love serve one another. For the whole Torah can be summed up in a single saying, love your neighbor as yourself. But if you bite and devour one another, watch out that you are not destroyed by one another. But I say, walk by the Ruach, the Spirit, and you will not carry out the desires of the flesh. For the flesh sets its desire against the Ruach, but the Ruach sets its desires against the flesh. For these are in opposition to one another, so that you cannot do what you want. But if you are led by the Ruach, you are not under the law. Now, the deeds of the flesh are clear. Sexual immorality, impurity, indecency, idolatry, witchcraft, hostility, strife, jealousy, rage, selfish ambition, dissension, factions, envy, drunkenness, carousing, and things like these. I am warning you, just as I warned you before, that those who do such things will not inherit God's kingdom. Now, we're going to pause there for a second because I want to point out this reality. While Paul is saying we are no longer under the law, in other words, he's not saying that we don't have a relationship to the Torah anymore, but what he is saying is our salvation, or or rather our righteousness, is not clinged upon whether or not we keep a checklist of commandments. Our righteousness is in the blood of Messiah, which allows us then the ability with the right heart, the right kavanah, the right intention of the heart as an act of worship to be obedient to the word of God. And so Paul then follows that statement up of saying you are, uh, if led by the Ruach, you are not under the law, to then say uh, all of these things that we just talked about, that we just read, are of the flesh, right? But if you look at each one of them, every single one of them, there are prohibition commandments in the Torah against them. So he's not saying anything new. He's not saying, hey, you don't have to worry about that Torah. Just ignore these things. Don't do these. He's saying, hey, all of the things that the Torah says do not do, they're all of the flesh, Right, so so if you just don't do these, you won't have to worry about it. Right? Well, how do we live that out? How do we understand? Well, we we follow the Torah. We we understand what the Torah says. But then he goes on. But the fruit of the ruach is love, joy, peace, patience, kindness, goodness, faithfulness, gentleness, and self control. Against such things there is no law. Why would he say against such things there is no law if he just pre- previously to that said that we're no longer under the law and 
If, as many in the church would say, by that statement, he's saying the Torah has no relation for us anymore. Why would he then say against such things there's no law? It's because just as all of the prohibitive things he mentioned that he calls uh, fruit of the flesh uh, are all mentioned in the Torah, desires of the flesh are all mentioned in the Torah, the fruit of the spirit that he mentions there are also all mentioned in the Torah. And these are all things that we're supposed to do versus things we're not supposed to do. And so Paul's making it very clear, and he goes on, Now those who belong to Messiah have crucified the flesh with its passions and desires. In other words, we've set all that terrible stuff aside, and we're now only seeking after, or should only be seeking after the desires of the Ruach. If we live by the Ruach, let us also walk by the Ruach. Let us not become conceited, provoking one another, envying one another. So I I, I just want to, to, to... pose that reality that Paul is not saying the Torah doesn't have a relatable aspect for us anymore as believers, but instead what he is saying is that the the, the Torah has pro, prohibition commandments and it has commandments that we're allowed to do, and the prohibition commandments are things that are of the flesh that Paul says we're not supposed to interact with that stuff anymore. As a prime example, uh, you know, Yeshua says the most important commandment is to love the Lord your God with all your heart, with all your soul, with all your strength, and likewise the second is love your neighbor as yourself, and upon these two commandments – is the entire Torah, uh, uh, does the entire Torah hang? The, the beauty of that statement is the fact that uh, all of the Torah, you can, you can take the entire Torah and break every single mitzvot, every single commandment down and realize that it fits into one of those two categories, either how we interact with, uh, with God or how we interact with our fellow man. Every single one, and then yeah. including the Asavet Hadibrot, the Ten Words of the Ten Commandments. Five of them deal with our relationship with God. Five of them deal with our relationship with man. Uh, the, the whole idea of you know love your neighbor as yourself, that's an awesome concept, right? The, the Yeshua says, love your neighbor as yourself, and that's equal to loving the Lord, uh, our God, with all of our heart, our soul, all of our mind, and all of our strength. How, okay, but that's great. But how do you do that? What does that look like? Well, right. we go back to the Torah. The, the Torah scripture says, actually says, "If you can't love your brother whom you see, how do you love? How can you love God whom you don't right. see?" So that's this concept of if you're loving your neighbor, if you're actually biblically loving your neighbor like you should, then you will, in essence, be loving God like yeah. you should. And and so if 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 we're to love our neighbor as ourselves, which by the way comes from the Torah, uh, uh, how how do we live that out? What does that look like? Right, we can look through the Brecha the Shah and we can find things that are there. But guess where all of that's coming from? It's all coming from the Torah. And what does the Torah say? Well, if you catch your neighbor's ox in the ditch, go help him get it out. Don't leave him stranded. If you see a hole on the ground that somebody might trip over, cover it up so nobody gets hurt. Uh, put a fence around the roof of your house if people are going to be walking around up there like it's a terrace. Make sure they can't fall and hurt themselves. Actually care for people. But these are all things that if we say I strive to do this, somebody's going to go, "Oh, that's legalistic." What, putting a fence around the roof of my house so that people don't fall off my terrace, that's legalistic? That's ridiculous. But if we say we keep kosher or we try to keep Shabbat, oh, that's legalistic. And that's – we're not going to argue that. And, You're being and legalistic. that goes back to that what I said earlier where yeah. people will say if you try to keep Shabbat or you keep the feasts and festivals or you keep kosher, then you're being legalistic. But if you don't commit fornication or you don't get drunk or you don't commit adultery, that's not being legalistic. And they're same thing. It's just a matter of who's doing it at the time or not doing it, depending on what you're saying. Yeah, I think sometimes that accusation comes out of a a place of feeling less than, or maybe I'm not doing. Which I don't know. Maybe it is conviction. You know, are you, are you doing enough? Like, are are you living for God the way you should live for God? Because um, you know, there's you know, if if you tell someone you keep uh, kosher. Well, the, a lot of times the answer is, well, that's too difficult. That's too hard. Well, it's like, but if you're doing it actively, it's not. It's mm-hmm. it's really easy to find kosher labeled ingredients. It's really easy to make kosher, uh, you know, foods um, at home. It's really easy to know what restaurants you can go to, what restaurants you can't. You know, it, it's when you actually do it, it it really isn't right. and people, that difficult. People naturally don't eat foods they don't want to eat or don't yeah. think. Or, for instance, almost nobody I hate green peas, and I will go out of my way to not eat them. Yeah, but no, almost nobody will say that's listening to this podcast. Anyhow, will believe that dog should be food. Now, there are people in certain countries that eat it, and it's a delicacy to them. But in the United States, dog is not considered food. Right, and nobody says it's legalistic not to eat dog because 
people say dog isn't food. Well, yeah. the Bible says pig isn't food. The Bible says catfish isn't food. The Bible, it's the same concept, and we should have the same ease of not eating it just simply because it's not supposed to be considered food. Nobody really has a fight about, hey, I got this poodle here who wants poodle burgers, or, or you know, I wonder if Great Dane tastes different than Chihuahua, and maybe the meat quality is different or any of that. We don't have that discussion because in our community, we have already decided dog isn't considered food. Yeah. Cat isn't considered food. And, right. and But for some reason, we don't consider not eating dog legalistic. Yeah. But somebody would say not eating pig or not eating shellfish or not eating catfish is legalism to the scripture. And I think to clarify this conversation a bit, it's important for us to lay some sense of a groundwork for what a definition of legalism actually is, mm-hmm. uh, because the terms thrown around haphazardly, but it actually has an actual meaning. It has, a, and, and so the concept of legalism is anything that you do to try and attain salvation or to try and attain anything on your own uh, in heaven. Yeah, things that you're trying for to do your on your own power, your own yeah. ability. Uh, but but the reality is is that and, and and I will say if you think that keeping Shabbat and keeping kosher has any connection to your earning salvation, you're being legalistic. Absolutely, all day long. Right. I will I will wholeheartedly say you yeah. are being legalistic. If you are going around to churches and there are messianic rabbis I know of that do this, that go around to churches and tell them all the places that they're wrong because they're. Uh, uh, Worshiping on Sundays and they're serving catfish uh, dinners and as fundraiser doing all the, all of these things. You're being legalistic because if the Lord's not already working on their heart in that area, that's not something you need to try to fix in them. Like that's the whole point to Acts 15. Acts 15, the the Jerusalem Council, right? James's words there are basically: Look, all of these Gentiles are coming in with no construct and no context for what Jewish worship looks like. Yeah. Uh, they're coming in from an entirely otherworldly worship experience. So we can't expect that these guys who have no connection and no context uh, to the Torah are going to somehow suddenly instantaneously know how to do it all. Right. So let's focus on the big issues, and those four things that are brought up are all directly connected to pagan worship. And and so they're saying, you're coming to a new worship construct that you've never understood before. That stuff doesn't float. So let's start here. Everything else you'll figure out little by little as you continue to build a relationship with the Word of God and you continue to hear the Torah on Shabbat and so on and so forth. You'll you'll start to, to figure more and more of it out. And the reality is, is that the same believers that will say that our effort to honor Torah as best we can by the leading of the Ruach HaKodesh, and I, and I always will preface saying we are Torah observant by saying that like if you're not doing it by the leading of the Ruach just don't do it because that's who gave us the Torah to begin with was the Holy Spirit inspired the writing of those words um and the entirety of the Bible as a whole, but um, the 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 reality is is that the the believers that will accuse Messianic Judaism of being legalistic uh, will not open up to the reality or admit the reality that most believers, most true Bible believing believers actually already walk out the majority of the Torah in their life. They are very literally doing what Paul discusses when Paul says, is it not considered righteous when those who are uncircumcised live as though they are circumcised, even though those that are circumcised are not living as though Mm -hmm. they are? Uh, Well, what does he mean by that? It means they're living out the Torah without even realizing they're doing that. And, And just like James brings up four issues that he says these are the starting point for these from the nations coming in. Uh, there's realistically only four issues, and I think we've even talked about this before on this podcast, but there's realistically only four issues that when we say we're, we strive to keep Torah, there's only four issues that the, the church is actually anti, that they're, they're, they're against, and that's physical circumcision, the weekly Shabbat. Uh, the Moedim, the appointed days, which technically Shabbat's a part of that, but uh, the the Shabbat, the Moedim, and keeping kosher, or the kashrut laws, the dietary laws of Leviticus 11 and other places in the Torah. And Those some are, of the cleanliness laws. Uh, to some degree, maybe. Yeah. Uh, but but the realis- reality of it is, is that those are the four primary issues. If you talk to any true Bible-believing pastor in the world, their sexual ethic is based out of the Torah. 
No questions asked. Right. Across the board, just as Rabbi Eric was saying earlier, the the same uh, Ten Commandments that I get the Shabbat from, you get the, uh, the 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 idea for adultery or fornication being wrong from. So why is it that I'm legalistic and you're not? Yeah. Right. The, the reality is, is most true Bible believing believers actually walk out the overwhelming majority of the Torah, yeah, honoring their, their father and yep. mother, loving God, uh, and desire Paul says, to serve. Yeah. And Paul says, if you're going to do any of it. You might as well do it all. So why are we throwing out these four things that you just don't like? Why are we doing that? Like, why right. do why are we legalistic in your eyes just because we don't throw out those four things, yeah. but we try to adapt them, apply and, them in our lives? And again, as we begin to wrap up, I, I did want to make one more yeah, point. Please. Yeah, um, it, 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 for me, I, and I've been reading this book uh, about grace, and this was just recent a uh, revelation that God gave me, and I just wanted to share it uh, because. A, 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 a Christian believer, a, 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 someone from the, a believer from the church, might ask, "Well, then, how does Jesus change how we relate to the Torah?" You know, I've always thought about that. You know, and I'm like, I, I don't quite know how to answer that. But I got this. I read this book, and it gave me such a revelation. So let's imagine if you're stranded on a mountain. You're stranded on a mountain by yourself. You want to get to the ground to be safe. If you jump off that mountain and try to flap your arms, your arms will not be able to harness the air, and the law of gravity will pull you to the ground, and you will die. Yeah. But what if you had something that could harness the air and could pull and, and could also harness the law of gravity and get you to the ground safely? That's What if you had a parachute? A parachute harnesses the air and, harness, and, and allows you to move through the law of gravity to get safely to the ground. Yeah. If we're flapping our – when we're legalistic, it's like we're jumping off the mountain and flapping our arms thinking, I can, I can do this it. This will do it. I can, make it. I can earn the grace. Get it. Yeshua is the parachute who harnesses the air, which is grace. And, but, does the, but here's the thing. When you jump off a mountain with a parachute, does the law of gravity still apply? Yes. It still applies, just like the Torah still applies. But we have something, the completed work of Yeshua that harnesses. Mm. That's good. I like that. And allows us to get where we need to be safely so we can navigate or look at it like a hang glider. We can move forward and navigate the Torah with the grace, Mm -hmm. with what Rabbi Eric said at the very beginning, grace and mercy. Yeah. Yeah. Grace and mercy. Which are a part of the Torah. So this has nothing to do with uh, what we're talking about, but just a random funny that came in my brain when you started talking about parachutes. I saw a joke yesterday that said, uh, you, you don't need a parachute to skydive. You only need a parachute if you want to do it twice. Right. So, sorry, continue. No, yeah. I'm just so it's, yeah, so that that's really important to understand that that the scripture says that God gave us the ruach hakodesh so that we would have the power to be witnesses. Because without the Holy Spirit, we don't have the power, we don't have the parachute, we don't have the ability to be a witness. And a witness is someone who testifies of an experience. And so our experience is Torah. Our experience is God's Word. Our experience is what He did. But we can't testify. We can't share that experience with others, and we can't be a demonstrator of that unless we have the power to do that. And that power comes not from ourselves, but from God. So I want to throw one more thing in here. because And and now I'm going to kind of play devil's advocate for a second because because there are aspects about Messianic Judaism, uh, and I don't mean about everybody within Messianic Judaism, but there are aspects about Messianic Judaism that very much are legalistic in in the way that we do things. Like I joked around earlier about you know Messianic rabbis going to churches and telling them all the places are doing things wrong. That's legalistic, no doubt about it. Um, but but as we've already discussed, being faithful in the Ruach, in the Spirit, in love and mercy, in compassion and grace to the Torah is not legalistic. But Yeshua does tell us very clearly in the the Sermon on the Mount in Matthew six, particularly mm-hmm. that when we are striving to to uh, live out the Word of God, that we need to do it with the right heart, the right intention, and the right uh, um, perspective for people outside. Right, and so the way he relates this to us is he talks about uh, the way that you give sadaka, you give gifts and tithes and, and such, right? Yeah. Your, your offerings and, and blessings that you give to other people. That if you're going to give sadaka, you give sadaka uh, where your right hand doesn't know what the left hand's doing, and, you know that kind of a thing. But you're, you're giving sadaka not to put on a show, 
right? So you're not dropping, you're not going around the sanctuary at the synagogue. Hey guys, I'm putting my sadaka, I'm putting my tithes in. You, I just want everybody to know, and I, you got to make sure you see it and, and put it in there. But when you're doing it, you do it quietly. You yeah. do it respectfully. You do it uh, because your heart is right. It's an act of worship. He says, if you're going to wear a uh don't wear them like ridiculously long so that because you want everybody to look at you and say, oh, look how pious this guy is. No, if you're going to do it, if you're going to live out the mitzvot of Sitziot, you are to do it in a way that it's not to make everybody's attention lure to you. I mean, they look strange enough. That's going to happen. Yeah. You don't have to go out of your way to make it happen. Uh, but, but when you're doing like, I'll never forget living in New York, watching a chassid drive down the, uh, the the New York State Thruway on a motorcycle. It was a little, he was a big guy on this like little Honda Rebel, you know, a little <laughs> two fifty or so motorcycle <laughs> riding down the New York State Thruway, which is feasible because the speed limit is only fifty five on there. But and uh, he's got his pails flapping in the wind like Goofy's ears behind him, and a seat seat flapping under his jacket off in the wind. That was, would shred him. It was it? absolutely Fair. funny to to see. But nonetheless, uh, I, I diverge back again. But uh, the the reality is is that uh, Yeshua says if you're going to do these things, don't do it for other people. You're not doing it to put on a show for other people. For you know, he, he he goes on to talk about prayer. Don't put on this big show about prayer, which goes uh, to we were having a conversation earlier before we started recording about speaking in tongues and you know that people make a show of it and what have you. Um, he goes on and, and say if you're going to fast, don't do it and 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 whine about Yom Kippur. I'm I'm terribly guilty of this myself. Yum Kippur, it's, it's amazing. We have we we have this one fast day a year. I mean, there's there's other fast days throughout Judaism as well, but there's one particular fast day that everybody agrees on. We should do it this day, right? Yeah. For whatever reason, that one day it's the hardest time to get through uh, without having to think about oh I'm hungry oh I'm hungry mm-hmm. I can go a day or three without eating and it won't phase me and I've done it I fasted for three four days before and it doesn't phase me you know especially once you get past that first day. But for whatever reason, Yum Kippur, the day that we have to do it. All of a sudden, I'm like, man, this is miserable. Right. There's days where I go to work, and I start working, and it's 3 or 4 o'clock, and I realize, you know, I haven't eaten anything all day. But on Yom Kippur, you roll out of bed. Yeah. Hungry. Hungry. Yeah. And, and and it just gets yeah. worse from there. Yeah. So that's a, and, good, that's a good point to how Paul says, the law showed me how sinful I was. Yeah, that's yeah, right. Yeah. But, but Yeshua says, Matthew 6, you know, if you're going to fast, don't do it with a sad face. Don't do it with this, this anger upon your face. Don't do it where you're making your fasting evident to people, right? Yeah. And so the same is true for our Torah observance. If we're going to live out the Torah, like we shouldn't be doing it to rub it in other people's faces that we're doing. That's legalism. Yeah. Like that's that's a problem. But if you're going to do it, do it with the right heart. Do it with the leading of the Ruach, with the leading of the Holy Spirit. Do it with grace and mercy as Rabbi Eric and, and Rabbi Toby were talking earlier. Do it with faithfulness to the word of God, yeah. not with trying to put on a show for everyone else around you because it isn't about everyone else. It's about your relationship with the Lord. And I don't care what you're talking about. I don't care if you're talking Old Testament, New Testament. I don't care what. If you're living out uh, the word of God in your life, it shouldn't be for other people. Right? There's an aspect where other people should see the presence of God in our lives because of the way we live and go, hey, uh, I, I, said, I said this in my class at Southeast Regional uh, a few weeks ago, and some of the looks in the room were kind of funny, but I was like, we should live our lives in such a way that the world looks at us and goes, hey, you don't look like you want to kill yourself. Can you tell me how to get there? Because that would be awesome if I could you know, be as happy as you are yeah. and in the whole room. And I went, well, if you thought that joke was dark, wait till later. But uh, the, the the reality, though, is, is that that is the world we live in. The entire world around us is dark and gloomy and, and despairing. And, and everybody is, is very literally on the right. rat race to death, uh, eternal death. Yeah. And we're to live our lives in a way that the Ruach shines. Through us, and people go, Hey, I want what you have. Yeah, Show our, our life should demonstrate holiness, and holiness means separateness. Yeah. But our separateness that people see shouldn't be because we're weird. Right. It should be because they see God's love yeah. ro- th- shining through us. Uh, you know, it's kind of like the other – a few weeks ago, we went fishing with my grandkids. And if you're just sitting there fishing and you're miserable because there's no fish biting and you're you're cold or uncomfortable or whatever – your grandkids aren't going to want to fish with you. Yeah. But if you're fishing there and you're having a good time, even if you're not catching anything, even if they're not biting, but you're smiling, you're enjoying it, and it, it's not burdensome, it's not, you know, they want to participate. And and the same thing with, with keeping the commandments of God. We should do so in such a way that 
our observance of Shabbat should be a delight that other people see and go, I want that. Not because we did anything, but because we fully immersed ourselves in the love of what we're doing and in God's love doing it. So that someone says, that that looks like something I want to do. Yeah, it's the same with the publican and the Pharisee. You know, Yeshua said, you know, you had two men in the temple. You know, the Pharisee was looking at, oh, I'm so obedient. I'm so glad I'm not like that dude in the back. Everything is uh, horizontal. He's looking at the guy next to him, right? Yeah. And Yeshua said, but the publicans in the back saying, have mercy on me, Lord, a poor sinner. Yeah. It's vertical, and it's about mercy. Yeah. And Yeshua saying, who do you think walked out with God's blessing? Yeah. It was... And I think the reason why is because the Pharisee was focused on what he saw as the perceived blessings of obedience, yeah. of his legalistic obedience. But the publican was going not to not he wasn't about the blessing; he was going to the blesser. Yeah, you know. And I think that's also a difference between legalism and true obedience: is do you want the blessings or do you want the blesser? Yeah, right. I love that parable because it kind of makes you have to be careful too. Because you know, if, if you stand there. And we sit in condemnation of the Pharisee. Ironically, that story then makes you the person who is like the Pharisee. So it's like it's one of those it's one of those things I love parables because it, it, it only makes, Yeshua can do that. Yes, and um, the um, so here's a question um, that we can all jump in on if you want. Um, since legalism often gets you know you're being a legalist, it gets thrown around. Yeah. Almost any time you challenge someone's um, doing or mm-hmm. participating in a mitzvot. Um, how do we, and this is kind of a question for us to answer and for other leaders who are listening to answer, how do you, how do we as leaders um, respond when you are offering correction to something that actually maybe need to be corrected, um, and then someone going, well, you're being too legalistic with that particular thing. So, for example, we uh, let's say you have an own egg, mm-hmm. and someone brings in... Uh, you know something with it, and they, and they begin telling you a story. They're like, "Yeah, uh, the rest of my family doesn't eat turkey bacon, but I do because I don't want to. You know, I don't want to eat pork. Um, but and you know, this morning I threw on the turkey bacon uh, to bring to own egg right after my uh, the rest of my family had finished cooking the pork bacon. Oh. You know, and just got <laughs> it real done real quick. Didn't have time to clean the pan, and so you know, here it is in the in the tinfoil tray I brought. You know, how do you you know? answer that respond to that and correct lovingly sure. that because you know okay yes I, technically you're not eating pork bacon yeah. but i think it's a two-part answer uh okay and, and it yeah. goes back to what we just talked about with the parable right yeah. yeah there's both sides of the discussion yes so as leaders we have to be humble and merciful and gracious in the correction yeah but the individual needing the correction, being corrected, also has to be willing to receive that in love and mercy and grace as well. You know, what I, I always tell people that in, in congregational ministry, you can pretty quickly tell who's teachable and who isn't. Yeah. By the way that they rile up against things that, you know, you know what I mean? So in that conversation, you know, like, and, and we've had, and I'm assuming this was maybe a, a semi-real experience that you're, you're discussing here, but we've had at our congregation at CMC, we've had where people, somebody brought once a, uh, a dish, I forget what it was, but it was like covered in like marshmallows or something. I oh, forget yeah. what it was. And, uh, and sweet potato casserole yeah. or something. It, it was something. I forget what it was. And, <laughs> and very swiftly, somebody went in, picked it up and walked out with it. And the they went to the person and said, "Hey!" And they didn't do it in the sanctuary. They didn't do it in the mm-hmm. where everybody was around. But they just very quietly, very you know, lovingly went to the person and said, "Hey, listen, are these marshmallows kosher?" And she goes, "I, I, I don't, I don't think so. I mean, I didn't, I don't, I don't know. I didn't know. You know, most people don't even realize marshmallows yeah, might yeah, not exactly. be kosher." Yeah. And she was like, "I didn't even know that that was a thing." And she said, "Well, look, if if we don't know for sure that these are kosher, uh, then they they probably shouldn't be yeah. here at, for own egg because you know uh, most marshmallows are made with with uh, from pork Jealous and so on and so on." Yeah. And, and and the person, but they said it really lovingly. They weren't like, "How could yeah. you possibly do?" Yeah. Just hey, would you do me a favor out of respect? Let's let's just save this for you know you can. You can have another time or whatever. Let's just be respectful. And and they were perfectly cool with it. They apologized. They took it out. It wasn't a big show in front yeah. of everybody. It wasn't yeah. a whole thing. I only know about it because it was said to me later on after yeah, yeah, service, yeah. Uh, separate from anything, uh, to, to let us know what, what went on. Um, and, and, and that's really what it comes from is – 
we, it doesn't matter how gracious and merciful we are and how we try to bring loving correction. Yeah. If the one receiving that correction also isn't approaching with the same humility, love, and mercy, uh, then it doesn't matter how we try to bring that correction. They're still going to explode. In the same sense, is, uh, it doesn't matter how willing that person is to receive that correction, how merciful they are and willing to and humble they are to receive it. If we come at them with the wrong attitude in yeah. that correction, they're not going to receive it. So really, um, we could boil it down almost to legalism is the observance of God's commands with the absence of humility on both correct. ends. That and of grace. teacher. Yeah, correct. That of teacher and student. Correct. Yeah. I hope this has been a blessing to you. If it has, I hope you'll share it with others. If you have any comments, questions, or subjects you'd like us to discuss on a future episode, feel free to reach out and contact us, and uh, we appreciate you being out there to uh, talk to. Thank you, and shalom. Thank you for listening to the Messy Antics Podcast. Make sure to subscribe so you can be notified every time we drop a new episode. And be sure to follow and interact with us on social media at Messy Antics Podcast.